I click this. So this is lecture one in number theory. And the topic is the division algorithm. Which in the text is chapter one, section one. So it's section 1.1. 1 .1. And this is just what you learned in elementary school. Uh, it's long division. Um, so in elementary school, you learn long division. There's a method that you have, and it seems to work. And what we start off with is proving that it really does work. So the basic concept is something called divisibility. Um, so we have integers. What are the integers? One, two, three, four. These are the positive integers. Of course, we also have zero and we have the negative integers and there are infinitely many of them. And if we take the set of all integers, so if you put something in curly brackets, that usually means the set and these are the elements. So this is an infinite set and it's usually denoted by this letter Z. So the letter Z comes from the word Zahlen in German, which means numbers. So this bold face Z, which you see everywhere in mathematics, stands for the set of all integers, positive, negative, and zero. And so suppose A and D are integers. And the way we write that mathematically in standard mathematical notation is that A and D are in Z. So this is a symbol, it's a kind of uh, uh, epsilon. And this Greek letter epsilon, when it's written this means is a member of the set. So this says A, D, and E. This means A and D are members of the set Z, which means they're integers. And we say that D is a divisor of A, or equivalently, A is a multiple of D if there exists an integer Q such that A is equal to DQ. And the notation for divisibility is D, a vertical line, A. So this notation means D divides A. So all we're saying is that three divides six. Three divides six because six is three times two. Okay. So the A in this case is six, the divisor D is three, and what is this number Q, which is sometimes called the quotient, is two. So you can tell your friends that you're taking an advanced class in mathematics, and the first thing you learned is that three divides six. Any questions about this? This is a fundamental definition. And divisibility has lots of properties. Um, for example, this property of divisibility is transitive. 
what that means is that if A, B, and C are integers. Uh, professor, would it be possible to lower the paper? Okay, thank you. And if A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. How do we prove this? So when you get to 300 level math classes, it's not like calculus where you just learn some formulas for differentiating functions. Here, the certain things you have to be able to calculate, but you also have to be able to prove statements. So this is a statement. If A divides B and B divides C, then A divides C. So how does the proof go? A divides C implies, right? This double kind of arrow means implies. There exists an integer Q such that B is equal to AQ. That's what it means for A to divide B. B divides C implies there exists an integer that's called Q prime such that C is B Q prime. If you put this together, what do you get? So therefore, three dots like this in a triangle means therefore, C, which is B Q prime, but B is A Q. That's A Q times Q prime, which is A times Q Q prime. Right? which is A times the number that say Q double prime, where Q double prime is Q times Q prime is an integer. So C is A times some integer. So therefore A divides C. This symbol means end of proof. Okay, so that's a proof. Um, any questions about this? Um, um, professor, uh, what method do you use? Uh, the deduction method? What kind of uh, technique? To thinking. Develop? Thinking. <laughs> the method of thinking. <laughs> uh, Thank you. <laughs> this is not induction. This is, um, you know, so in mathematics, uh, uh, proofs require, uh, among other things, a certain amount of uh, imagination and creativity, right? Like writing a poem or painting a landscape. So um, it involves just thinking and coming up with some ideas that work. So here, I'm just using the definitions. Uh, A divide B means B is AQ for some integer Q. B divide C means C is B times Q prime for some integer Q prime. And then I had the idea of putting this together, taking B equals AQ, so substituting AQ for B, that's what I did here. I substituted AQ for B, multiplications associative, AQ times Q prime is the same as A times Q, Q prime. And again, they teach you in elementary school that the product of two integers is an integer. So Q, Q prime is some integer, I'll just call it Q double prime. And I have C is A times Q double prime. So C is some integer multiple of A, that means A divides C and we're done. So that's, that's what it is, okay. Any other questions? Okay. 
Now, there is one fundamental principle that, um, well, there's more than one, but we'll start with a fundamental principle, which if you like, is sort of an axiom in mathematics. Uh, someone just asked whether I used induction. Uh, there's something called the principle of mathematical induction. Uh, we'll show that that is actually equivalent to the following, which is called the minimum principle. So this is, if you like, an axiom. This is something that we don't prove. Uh, just as we start with the integers, one, two, three, we also start with the knowledge of the minimum principle. And what it says is the following. Every non-empty set, well, stated in two forms, one slightly more general, Every non-empty set of non-negative integers contains a smallest element. So there's something called the empty set. That's a set that has no elements in it. There's nothing in it. But if you have a set that contains at least one element, it could contain one, it could contain 10, could contain infinitely many. If, if it, a set that contains something is called non-empty. And if this says, if you have a non-empty set of non-negative integers, there's always a smallest element in it. And um, for example, suppose that uh, X, is the set of positive even integers. What is the smallest element of X? It's two. So in this set of positive even integers, there are infinitely many numbers in it two, four, six, eight, and so forth, but it does contain a smallest element and the smallest element is two. And we're saying that this is a general property of any set of non-negative integers, if it's not empty, there's always a smallest element. And you might say, well, that's kind of obvious, but It's not true for fractions. So the minimum principle fails for positive or non-negative fractions. A fraction is what's also called a rational number. For example, If you let X be the set consisting of the numbers one, a half, a third, a fourth, a fifth, and so forth, all numbers one over N for every positive integer N, this set can, it's a set of positive fractions, but it contains no minimal element because For every n, the number one over n can't be the smallest element because one over n plus one is also in the set. So no matter what number you give me in this set, I can always find a smaller one. So it's a very important point that the minimum principle is true for integers. It is not true for other kinds of numbers, okay? And now the minimum principle is also true, not for the set of all integers. So So 
So the minimum principle also may fail for sets of integers that are not all non-negative. For example, here's the simplest example. Suppose I take the set Z of all integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth, but also minus 1, minus 2, all positive and negative integers. This is an infinite non-empty set. This is a non-empty set of integers. that contains no smallest element. So the minimum principle applies to sets of non-negative integers. It doesn't necessarily apply to sets of integers. Um, the only small extension of the minimum principle you could state is the following. So this is just an easy extension. A set of numbers is called bounded below. A set X is bounded below if there exists a number C such that x is greater than or equal to c for all elements x in the set. So the set of non-negative integers is bounded below by zero. The set of all integers is not bounded below. It's not true that every integer is bigger than some number c for some c. And the second form of the minimal principle says that Every non-empty set of integers that is bounded below contains the smallest element. So, in some sense, this is a, an obvious statement. Um, set of integers that's non-negative contains the smallest element. And it's infinitely useful in number theory. And our first use of it will be to prove what is called the division algorithm. That just says you can divide one number by a number, by another, and get a quotient and remainder that are unique. Okay. So uh, let me just ask, are there any questions before I begin the division algorithm? So, the division algorithm says the following, let A and D be integers with D positive. Zero is not positive. Zero is zero. A number greater than zero is positive. A number less than zero is negative. And zero is neither positive nor negative. So that A and D be integers with D positive, which means D is greater than or equal to one. There exist unique, so both of these words are important, existence and uniqueness. There exist unique integers Q and R such that A is dq plus r and r is between zero and d minus one. d is at least one, so d minus one is non-negative.
So this is just long division. Q is called the quotient. R is called the remainder. So for example, if you take A equal to 37 and D equal five, if you divide five into 37, 37 is five times seven plus two. So the quotient Q is seven and the remainder is two. That's all we're doing. So is it clear what the division algorithm says? I'm going to prove it. The proof says you can always represent a number A, numbers A and D in this form if D is positive, where the quotient and the remainder are unique. So we have existence, there exists D and R that satisfy this equation and this inequality, and there's a unique pair of numbers, Q and R, that does that. Okay. So the proof is as follows. We only have one tool at our disposal to prove something and that's the minimum principle. And to use the minimum principle, we need a non-empty set of non-negative integers. So that S be the set of non-negative integers of the form a minus dx with x an integer, positive, negative, or zero. So we look at all non-negative integers that can be written in this way. So first of all, I claim s is not empty. So again, more notation in the beginning, there's always a lot of notation in the math class. The empty set, the set with nothing in it is written like this. It looks like a zero with a slash through it. It's actually a letter in the Norwegian alphabet, but this symbol denotes the empty set. So to say that S is not empty is the same as saying S is not equal to the empty set, right? So these two statements are equivalent. And how do I show S is non-empty? Well, we'll divide it into two cases. If A happens to be non-negative, then A is A minus D times zero. Is in S. Right? If I let x equals zero, a minus d times zero is a. So this is a non-negative integer in S. So S is an empty. That's the first case. In the second case, if a is negative, let, I'm going to choose x to be a negative number. So I'm gonna write that x equal minus y, where y is positive. So then a minus dx minus x is equal to y. This is a plus dy. Now we know A is negative, but D is positive and A is fixed. So if I take Y big enough, DY is gonna be bigger in absolute value than A. 
So this is greater than zero for y sufficiently large. So therefore, a minus dx is an s, which is not the empty set. I'm sorry, Professor. Could you could you repeat that again? Yeah, Starting let me just give an example. Okay. Suppose like a is minus 200 and d is 3, right? So I want to show that I can find an x such that a minus dx is positive. So I'm going to let x be a negative number. I'm going to write it in the form minus y. So a minus dx is minus 200. That's what a is. Minus 3 times x, right, for some x. But if I let x be minus y, this is minus 200 minus x is y. So this is minus 200 plus 3y. So for example, this is greater than 0 if y is, I don't know, 70. So I'm letting x be equal to minus 70. So a minus dx, a is minus 200, minus 3, that's minus d, 3, times minus 70, that's minus 200 plus 210, that's positive. Right? 10 is positive. So, e so even when a is negative, if d is positive, d is always positive, I can always choose an x such that a minus dx is positive. So in this case, in this example where a was minus 200 and d is 3, I let x be equal to minus 70. And then a minus dx is positive. So if you look at the example, um, and think about it for a bit, usually with some paper and pencil handy, then this more general statement is becomes pretty clear. So what we have is S, which is a set of all numbers of the form A minus DX that are greater than or equal to zero, is non-empty. That is, this is a non-empty set of non-negative integers. So by the minimum principle, S contains a smallest element, I'll call it R, which is A minus DQ for some integer Q. So this number R is the smallest element in this set. Right? The minimum principle says that a set of non-negative integers contains the smallest element. Now, I want to know that R, so, so I have numbers Q and R such that A minus DQ equals R. If I rearrange that, A is DQ plus R. So I must show that R, the remainder, is between zero and D minus one. Okay. Now, S is a set of non-negative integers.
Right? Every element of S is non-negative. R is an S, so R is not is non-negative. But how do I get this upper bound? How do I prove that R is at most D minus one? So we'll prove by contradiction. Suppose R is not less than or equal to D minus one. Suppose R, which is A minus DQ, is greater than or equal to D, right? So this is a proof by contradiction. We want to show R is less than or equal to D minus one. We'll suppose that it's not and show that leads to a contradiction and mathematics is supposed to be free of contradictions. So any statement that leads to a contradiction has to be false. So here's a statement, R is greater than or equal to D. What does this imply? So if R is greater than or equal to D, R minus D, just subtract D from both sides of the inequality, which is A minus DQ minus D is greater than or equal to D minus D, which is zero. Right? But I can rewrite this. This says that A minus D times Q plus one is greater than or equal to zero, right? I mean, I'm just factoring out D from this. To factor out D, I get D times Q plus one. So it's minus D times Q plus one and D is positive. So R minus D is strictly smaller than R. And this, see this says that R minus D is an S because R minus D is a number of the form A minus D times an integer that's non-negative. And this is a contradiction because R is the smallest element in S. So it cannot be that R is greater than or equal to D. It must be that R is less than or equal to D minus one. So this proves existence. Right. What do I mean by saying this proves existence? It means the following. So, Given A and D integers with D greater than or equal to one, there exist, this is existence, integers Q and R such that A is DQ plus R and this remainder R is strictly smaller than D and non-negative between zero and D minus one. So that's existence. Right. So that's half of the proof of the theorem. What about uniqueness? So the uniqueness statement means the following. The Q1, Q2, R1, R2 be integers with R1 and R2 both between zero and D minus one, such that A is DQ1 plus R1 and also DQ2 plus R2. We must show the quotients are the same And the remainders are the same.
Now, if I take this expression and rearrange it, I get dq1 minus dq2 equals r2 minus r1, right? I just rearrange this equation. And of course, on this side, I can factor out the d. This is d times q1 minus q2. So if I take the absolute value of both sides, d is positive, d times the absolute value of q1 minus q2 is equal to the absolute value of r2 minus r1. And what can we say about the absolute value of r2 and r1? So here's the number line from zero to d minus one. And somewhere in here, we have the two numbers, R1 and R2. They're between zero and D minus one in one order or the other, but, or they could even be the same. But in any case, if you have two numbers between zero and D minus one, the distance between them is at most the length of the interval, which is at most D minus one. So if R1 and R2 are between zero and D minus one, the absolute value of their difference is at most D minus one. Now, Q1 and Q2 are integers. So if Q1 is different from Q2, then the absolute value of their difference is at least one. You can't have two integers that are only you know, half a unit apart. They're integers. So this means that D times the absolute value of Q1 minus Q2 is at least D times one. But this is less than or equal to D minus one. And this inequality says D is less than or equal to D minus one, which is absurd. This is a contradiction. So what led to the contradiction? What led to the contradiction was saying if Q1 is different from Q2. This says they can't be different. So therefore, Q1 equals Q2. And so, zero, which is Q1 minus Q2, right? If two numbers are equal, their difference is zero. Multiply it by D, it's still zero, is R2 minus R1. So R1 equals R2. So this proves uniqueness. If you have two ways to write a number as DQ plus R with the remainder R between zero and D minus one, it's unique. Any two representations must in fact have the same quotients and the same remainders. So that is the proof of the division algorithm. Okay. So if you have any questions right now, you can ask, but what is supposed to happen in mathematics is things that when you see them for the first time, aren't uh, clear, but you sit down somewhere in a quiet place, perhaps, and you go through the proof and you think about it line by line, statement by statement, and try to understand it. Yeah, professor. Uh, yeah. The, the question I got, I asked before, because in order to do those statements, those methods, I mentioned the deduction method and, and the proof by conservation, the proof, you know, those techniques. All right. um, how can I develop that thinking? Because I use memorizing formula and not reason because this is reasoning right there. So how, how can I proceed? Because this is very new for me. Right, to, so to when you're seeing proofs for the first time, 
it is very difficult and complicated, even though each individual step is um, simple. It's just a matter of investing uh, time and effort and thinking a lot about what's going on. It's, uh, it's a psychological process. It's a learning process. It's not like differentiating a function. You learn the chain rule and you can differentiate everything. Uh, here, you just have to learn, you have to acquire the ability to develop a mathematical argument. And it involves really studying the proof line by line and try and making sure you understand. Not, you don't want to memorize the proof. I mean, it's okay to memorize anything you want to memorize, but the important thing is to understand what's going on step by step. Let's see. Someone named Miguel just logged on to the lecture, but I need to have your last name for attendance. So there's a Miguel Lorenzo, but there's another Miguel. So if you would just change the name, uh, your name, uh, or put it in the chat so I can mark uh, that you're present today. Here are two simple examples of the division algorithm. So suppose I want to divide 16 by seven. That means my number A is 16. My divisor, what I'm dividing by is seven and 16 is equal to seven times two plus two. So the quotient Q is equal to two and the remainder is two. And two is between zero and D minus one, which is seven minus one or six. So this is the statement of the division algorithm in this case. Suppose I want to divide minus 16 by seven. So now A is minus 16 and D is seven. And it is certainly true that minus 16 is seven times minus two plus minus two. I'm just multiplying this by minus one. So this is a true statement, but this is not the division algorithm because my remainder what would be my remainder in this case, minus two is not between zero and six, this is false. So this is a true statement, but it's not the division algorithm. We want a remainder between zero and six. But what I can say is minus 16 is seven times minus three, that's minus 21 plus five. So this is A is DQ plus R. So A is minus 16, D is seven. My quotient is minus three and my remainder is five and five is between zero and six. So this is the correct statement of the division algorithm. When you divide minus 16 by seven, you always get a non-negative remainder in the division algorithm and the unique remainder is seven. Okay, any questions so far? All right, now, the principle of mathematical induction has been mentioned, 
And it says the following. So suppose S of K is some statement about all integers K from some point on, say greater than or equal to zero or greater than or equal to K naught. So this might be the statement that says K is even, okay? It's just some statement about integers. So if the statement, I mean, statement can be true or false for a given integer. But if it's, if S of K naught is true, and if for any K greater than K naught, S of K minus one true implies that S of K is true. Then S of K is true for all K greater than or equal to K naught. So in particular, let's say for k naught equal to zero, if the statement is true for zero and s of k minus one implies s of k for all k greater than zero, then s of k is true for all non-negative integers k. Maybe in the, my example, let's start with one. So if S of one is true, and whenever it's true for K minus one, the statement is true for K, then the statement is true for all positive integers. So here's a simple example. Of the principle of mathematical induction. Suppose S of K is the following statement. It says that k squared is the sum of the first k odd integers. So let's just see what this means. What does s of one mean? Well, s of one is one squared is one. So one squared is the sum of the first odd integer. What about s of two? Well, two squared is four, which is one plus three. So four, two squared is the sum of the first two odd integers. S of three, if you look at nine, three squared, which is nine, what are the, sum, what are the first three odd integers? One, three, five. If you add them up, you get nine. What are the first four odd integers? One, three, five, seven. If you add them up, you get 16, which is four squared. That's the statement S of four, right? So four squared is the sum of the first four odd numbers, right? And this statement says that this is true, not just for the first four squares, but for every square. That k, if k squared, for every positive integer k, k squared is the sum of the first k odd numbers. So 
So let's prove this. I'll state this as a little theorem perhaps. K squared is the sum of the first K odd integers. So we'll call the statement S of K. Proof. Must prove for K equal one. That's the first step. We already did that. One squared is one. That's the proof. One squared is the sum of the first odd integer. Right. What are the odd integers? One, three, five, seven, and so forth. You can write every odd integer. This is two times one minus one. This is two times two minus one. This is two times three minus one. This is two times four minus one. In general, if we take the odd integer 2k minus 1, that's 2 times k minus 1. So this is a formula for the kth odd integer. So that k be at least 2 and assume s of k minus 1 is true. So what does that mean? That means that k minus one squared is the sum of the first k minus one odd integers. So k minus one squared is one plus three plus five. This is the kth odd integer. What is the k minus first odd integer? It'll be two times k minus one plus one. Right. So this is what is called the induction hypothesis. We're assuming s of k minus one is true. That means that k minus one squared is the sum of the first k minus one odd numbers. The sum of the first k odd integers is one plus three plus five. The k minus first is two times k minus one minus one. And the kth odd integer is 2k minus 1. But this, we know, is k minus 1 squared plus 2k minus 1. What is k minus 1 squared? That's k squared minus 2k plus 1 plus 2k minus 1. Plus 2k cancels minus 2k minus one cancels plus one, we're left with k squared. So S of k is true. So what I just proved is that if, the k, if k minus one squared is the sum of the first k minus one odd integers, then k squared is the sum of the first k odd integers. So S of K minus one true implies S of K is true. So by induction, S of K is true for all K greater than or equal to one. And that's the proof. Mm-hmm.
Any questions about that? So now I will prove a very important and really interesting result. And I will use the method of mathematical induction um, So in computer science, People use what is often called binary notation. It says that every positive integer is uniquely a sum of different distinct powers of two. So for example, 75, let's see, you can write that as 64 plus 11. 11 is eight plus three. Three is two plus one. So this is 64 is two to the sixth plus two cubed plus two to the first power plus two to the zero, right? So you can write a positive integer as a sum of different powers of two. Yeah. And computer scientists tend to like numbers written in binary for various reasons. But you can also write numbers. You can also have what might be called Turner notation. Every positive integer is uniquely a sum um, of, um, I'm going to say powers of three. with each power used at most twice. So what are the powers of three? One, three, nine, 27, 81, and so forth. So if I wanna write 75 as a sum of powers of three, I can't use 81, that's too big. I can use 27, 75 is 27 plus um, 48, I think. And 48 is 27 plus 21. For 21, I can use nine. This is 27 plus 27 plus nine plus 12. That's 27 plus 27 plus nine plus nine plus three. So 27 is three cubed, and I used it twice. Nine is three squared, and I used it once. And three is three to the first power, and I used it once. So this is the ternary representation of 75. I'm writing 75 as a sum of powers of three, which each with each power of three used at most two times. So we have binary notation, we have ternary notation. I haven't proved that this is always possible, but that's what I'm about to do. Or more generally, we have the following. This is a theorem. 
let m be an integer. m at least two. Every positive integer n can be represented uniquely in the form. So it's going to be the sum of powers of m. N is some number plus A1 times M, A2 times M squared, up to some A sub K, M to the K, where K is the unique non-negative integer such that n is at least m to the k and strictly smaller than m to the k plus one. And a sub k is positive and at most m minus one. And the integers a sub i are between zero and m minus one, or i going from zero, one, two, up to k minus one. A, these coefficients, a zero, a one, up to a sub k are integers. So this says that you can write every number uniquely as a sum, every positive integer is a sum of powers of m with non-negative integral coefficients no bigger than m minus one. And this is called the m attic representation of n. And The integers a sub i are the digits of n to base m. And a perfect example, this is what I just calculated. For m equal to three, if n is 75, this is two times three cubed plus one times three squared plus one times three to the one. And if you like zero times three to the zero. And 75 is between three cubed and three to the fourth. So K is equal to three. So take 75 is between three cubed and three to the fourth. So the highest power of three, no bigger than 75 is three. So K is three and 75 has this three attic representation or ternary representation with the digit zero, one, this should be a two, zero, one, two and two. So this is a very serious theorem. It's the main result of today's lesson. And we'll prove it by mathematical induction. So the proof will be by mathematical induction. So we fix 
our base M greater than or equal to two. And for K greater than or equal to zero, let S of K be the following statement. Every integer in the interval from m to the k to m to the k plus 1 has a unique, what we call m-adic representation. So what does the statement say for S of zero when K is equal to zero? When K is zero, we're looking at N between M to the zero and M to the zero plus one. M to the zero is one means we're looking at numbers N between one and M. Less than M means less than or equal to M minus one. So K is zero. And n, well, let a zero equal n. n equals n equals n. n equals a zero. This is an m attic representation. It's like, what is the m at, What is the three attic representation of two? Two equals two, or two times three to the zero. And this is unique. If you had another representation, it can't involve a power of three bigger than three. So it's just some number between zero and two and zero and n minus one, that's what it is. So when k is zero, this is just saying that every number between one and m minus one has a unique representation. And it's just the number equal to itself. So this is the easy case, but doesn't mean that it doesn't require a certain amount of thinking to understand what's involved. Okay, so now we do the inductive step. Let K be at least one, and we assume that the statements S of zero, S of one, up to S of K minus one are true. Then we want to prove S of K. That is, we're looking at integers N between M to the K and m to the k plus one. Okay, so suppose we take an N in this range. Let's apply the division algorithm. We can write M, divide N by M to the K. N is M to the K times Q plus a remainder where the remainder is between zero and M to the K minus one. Let's just write my remainder Q. I'll just use it, call it A sub K. So N is M to the K times A sub K plus R. 
or R is N minus A sub K times M to the K. And R is between M to the K minus one and zero. Let me just collect the relevant information here. We have a number n between m to the k and m to the k plus one. Divide n by m to the k by the division algorithm. So we get n is some, and let's call the quotient, a sub k. So n is a sub k times m to the k plus the remainder, where the remainder is less than what you're dividing by. So less than or equal to m to the k minus one. And because n is greater than or equal to m to the k, that means a sub k has to be positive. Because if a sub k were zero, n would be equal to r, that's less than m to the k, and n is greater than or equal to m to the k. Also, a to the k n, which is a sub k m to the k plus r, r is strictly less than m to the k. So this is strictly less than a sub k m to the k plus m to the k, which is a sub k plus one times n to the k. And n is greater than or equal to m to the k. So divide this inequality by m to the k, I get one is strictly less than a sub k plus one, which means if a sub k plus one is strictly greater than, uh, oops, let's see. Um, what do I want to say? This is true, but this is not what I wanted to say. So let me cross this out. So we have n, which is a sub k m to the k plus r. Professor, r is at least zero. Oops, sorry, thank you. R is at least zero. So this is greater than or equal to a sub k m to the k. Right? Let's throw away something non negative, you get something smaller. And n itself was less than m to the k plus one. So if I divide by m sub to the power k, I get a sub k is less than m, which means a sub k is less than or equal to m minus one. And I already proved it's greater than or equal to one. So I have, I have a number n, which is between m to the k and m to the k plus one. I write n as some number a sub k times m to the k plus the remainder. And this number a sub k is positive and between and no bigger than m minus one. And zero is less than or equal to r, is less than or equal to m to the k minus one. So by the induction hypothesis, we can write R as some, R has an emetic representation.
So R can be written as A0 plus A1M plus A2M squared up to at most A sub K minus one M to the K minus one, because R is less than M to the K. So N is A to the K M plus R, A to the K M to the K plus R, that's A0 plus A1M up to a sub k minus one m to the k minus one plus a sub k m to the k. So this proves existence. Every non-negative integer has at least one emmatic representation. We must show uniqueness. We must show that every integer has only one emmatic representation. So, suppose the number n can be written as a0 plus a1m plus a2m squared up to a sub k m to the k. And we can also write n as b0 plus b1m plus b2m squared plus b sub l m to the l. where the digits, the AIs and the BIs are integers between zero and M minus one. We wanna show this is unique. So, must prove k equals l, the highest power m is the same in both cases, and that ai equals bi for all i from zero up to k. So let's suppose k and l are different. Suppose K is less than L. What can we say? N is A0 plus A1M plus A sub K M to the K. Now the AIs are all with most M minus one. So this is less than or equal to M minus one, replacing A0 plus M minus one M plus m minus one m squared up to m minus one m to the k. If I factor out an m minus one from this, I get m minus one times one plus m plus m squared up to m to the k. This is a finite geometric progression. In calculus, you learned that the sum of this progression is m to the k plus one minus one over m minus one. The m minus ones cancel. This is m to the k plus one minus one. That's strictly less than m to the k plus one. On the other hand, n, which is b0 plus b1m up to b sub l m to the l, this is bigger than what you get if you throw away the first terms. This is bigger than b sub l m to the l. 
and b sub l is at least one. So this is greater than or equal to m to the l. And if l is greater than k, this is greater than or equal to m to the k plus one. And m to the k plus one is strictly bigger than n. And this is a contradiction because n is not strictly less than n. So this is a proof that k equals L. So we have n is a0 plus a1m up to a sub k m to the k is b0 plus b1m up to b sub k m to the k. I also claim that ak equals vk. If not, let's say that um, a k is less than B k, then N minus A k M to the K, I'm just subtracting this from both sides of this equation. I get A zero plus A one M plus A sub K minus one M to the K minus one equals B zero plus B one M plus b sub k minus one m to the k minus one plus b sub k m to the k minus a k m to the k, I get this. So this number n minus a k m to the k is equal to this and it's equal to this. And this is some positive coefficient, some positive digit. But this number, is less than m to the k. And this number is greater than or equal to plus m to the k. And you can't have a number less than itself. So a k equals b k. So that says that a zero plus a one m up to a sub k m minus one m to the k minus one I can just cancel this term from both sides is B zero plus B one M up to B sub K minus one M sub K minus one. And now the induction hypothesis imply falls in by the induction hypothesis. AI equals BI for I going from zero up to K minus one. And that's the proof. Okay, wow. Well, depending on your point of view, we either did a lot or a little first day of class. We just proved two theorems, the division algorithm and the existence and uniqueness of an M-adic representation for an integer. On the other hand, this uses proof techniques that uh, may be completely new to you. And in that case, it really takes a lot of time and a lot of work to try to understand what's going on. But the key in this course is to understand the theoretical material. You'll have a few problems in the homework and a few problems on the exams where you have to calculate things. Like if I say, what is the two attic representation of 100? You know, you, you can figure it out, but then you also have to be able to prove statements. And the more time you spend trying to understand the concepts of a proof, the better, okay? And the homework for Monday, uh, if you don't have the book, I will actually post the problems on Blackboard are the 
first 10 exercises at the end of section 1.1. And um, you will do the homework, write it out, convert to a PDF file, and upload to the assignment section of Blackboard.